Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France Venquet debate. We're talking uh, after uh, with the fall of Ramadi, the capital of mostly Sunni Anbar province in Iraq. Everybody thought that um, that's it. The jihadists were on the back foot when Saddam Hussein's hometown of uh, Tikrit uh, came back under government control. Not so, says our panel. We're joined uh, by Zaid al-Ali, uh, the author of uh, The Struggle for Iraq's Future, who joins us uh, from Cairo here in the studio. Regis Le Semi, associate editor at French News Weekly magazine uh, Paris Match, and the author of a biography on the general um, who uh, led the surge in Iraq back in 2006 and 2007, David Petraeus. We're also with Anne Nivat, a uh, reporter who has been uh, to Iraq on countless occasions. And uh, Alan Caval, who's uh, just back. Well, actually, I should say, uh, it's not often that you you're, you unpack your bags here in Paris. You're mostly either in Turkey or in um, uh, the capital of Iraqi Kurdistan these days, uh, Erbil. Uh, welcome back uh, to the show. Just before the break, uh, we were talking about uh, the days when the United States uh, was in control. Régis Le Sommier mentioning back in 2005 in the election that brought former Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki to power. Uh, back in 2011, when the last U.S. troops were gearing up for their final uh, pullout, France 24's team accompanied uh, one patrol in Anbar province, oh, where already there was a sense that all the painstaking work to win over Sunni tribesmen was on the line. A strong uh, democratic uh, background here for the last, you know, several years, and you know, the challenge before them is to maintain that course and and to come together as a nation, uh, accepting of all their cultures and 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 embracing their diversity as as a one Iraqi nation. All right, that was the that was a word the word back in 2011. The hope back in 2011. Yeah, That's well, ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous, but uh, I, I think that was uh, what the soldier genuine, genuinely believed uh, uh, at the time, because they were serving, you know, they spent uh, years and years in Iraq, I mean, trying to improve their, their piece of ground or, 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 or territory that they were given. No, I, I'm, I'm, I must say that the, I'm, I was amazed uh, uh, this weekend by the, uh, the rhetoric of the Pentagon, the, the fact that they're so, sort of uh, saying, uh, they're talking about episodic successes for for. ISIS, uh, not really uh, admitting that there's uh, there's been you know that ISIS is still very much alive. They're not on the back burn. They're not uh, really pushed. And 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 I, I was thinking to myself, are we going to hear uh, what we heard back then? Was uh, uh, it's going to get worse before it gets better? You know that kind of rhetoric that the Pentagon or the, you know uh, uh, the American government because, used because to describe the situation, which obviously was not going in in in, in the right way. So. Um, uh, this the time, truth is, the, Regis, they don't know what to say anymore. They don't know what kind of words to find in order to ground, describe. Think, yeah, you know? exactly. To avoid yes. troops on the ground. They have had troops on the ground for almost 10 yes. years. We know the result. Mm -hmm. Now they are trying slightly, a slightly different strategy. But yeah. so the problem is uh, how how deep should they be become involved again? And they don't want to become involved again. Mm. Alan Caval, what do you say if you're the Pentagon? Oh. <laughs> That's a tough question. Which you're not. But I'm not, and I, and I thank God for not being <laughs> in their shoes at the moment. But no, I mean, this, this kind of PR, of course, it sounds ridiculous, as you say, given the, the reality we have, we have, keeping, we have been keeping worsening uh, since, since then. And <clears throat> actually, I'm afraid there is, I don't see anything uh, to be done to, to, to improve the situation. Uh, except for hollow uh, statements about the uh, the integrity of the Iraqi state and uh, the necessity to build a civil society which would be extra extra, it doesn't work at all. Uh, what we see is, a, is a, an allowed civil war, and there is absolutely no way of of getting out of it. Uh as and, I see it. And I think t territorially now, I mean, things are really clear cut. I mean, with the exception of Tikrit and a few enclaves uh, in okay. the Sunni pockets, you know, we can say Abu Ghraib or Baghdadi, which is a town north of uh, Ramadi, who still are in uh, government control. Most of the Sunni land uh, lies uh, with ISIS, uh, side, sides with ISIS these and days. And, and, and this is understandable. I think it's not, we have to understand that it's not a question of bad guys, good guys this time. Oh. Uh, this, you know, mannequin rhetoric does not work because the Sunni 
you know, they were in power for 30 years under Saddam. Um, what, what, uh, who was the, were the people in Ramadi, Fallujah? They were soldiers of Saddam. They were officers. Most of them, you know, had their, uh, uh, their residence over there. So uh, they naturally sided when the insurgency start, started. That was the hotbed of the insurgency right away. And, and it's still there. And as long as these people were not willing to give up the power, now on the other side, on the other side with the with the Shia, what you have is you have people that are come to power that have uh, taken their revenge, whether it was with the help of Iran or you know uh, uh, with the Iraqi government, and they're not willing to give up or compromise. So you have this situation where most of the Sunni lands is occupied by ISIS, and they're going to go with ISIS N tomorrow. They could go with somebody else. I think that's <coughs> at this point there is a possibility of solution if. The Iraqi government or someone, I don't know who could be the power broker at this point, but who's, someone could be able to turn the tide and turn the tribes against ISIS. But at this time, they, they believe ISIS is the better solution. Zaid Al Ali, you've worked on institution building <laughs> in Iraq. Uh, is there a solution? I mean, there, there was the making of a solution at some point, right? So uh, when there was the, the earlier civil conflict that took place between six started around about 2005 and lasted around about until end of 2007. Um, at that point, from 2008 all the way to around about 2011, there was the making of a national army, right? Um, and that, in that institution for that period of time had a lot of respect in a lot of parts of Iraq, uh, south, north, west, and east, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and many people were expecting at that time that that national institution would go on from strength to strength and continue being building. Sadly, what we discovered uh, over time, I mean, many people were warning about this during 2012, 13, 14, 15, is that, uh, is that that institution wasn't being developed and wasn't being given any of the investment that it should be given or training, so on and so forth. So, and, and the reason why that was the case wasn't because uh, Iraqis don't want it because the Iraqi people didn't want it. The reason why is because the, the very few people who happened to be in charge, meaning the prime minister at the time and those people who surrounded him, were one, incredibly corrupt, and two, incredibly incompetent, and had no idea what it was that they were doing in terms of institution building. I mean, these are people who had never had a job uh, until 2005 and 2006, and then suddenly became prime minister, right? I mean, you, people really need to put that into perspective, that this is the type of political class that was bequeathed to us by the exile community and by Iran and the United States and other foreign nations, right? So, I mean, institution building is, is not impossible. Of course it can happen. It's been happened in many much more difficult circumstances around the world, in Europe after World War II, so on and so forth, in much more difficult circumstances, people were able to turn around and to get the job done. And of course it can happen in Iraq, but what really needs to happen in order for that to happen is you really need a big change in the top uh, political class in the country. Because otherwise, what we're just going to have is just more of the same. And that's where the real challenge lies. That's the real challenge. Uh, and Ivan is trying to ensure for that change to take place. The previous prime minister, Al Maliki, uh, was supported by the Americans. They wanted him in power. And then when he became too powerful, too visibly, obviously, pro-Shia, of course, they wanted him out. Now we have another one, Al Abadi, who is now, according to the situation, the latest situation, ap appearing very weak. It's a very, it's a moment of weakness for the new prime minister now. The fact that he was incapable of retaking uh, Ramadi, and plus to that, he is now asking the Shia militias to come in to come in in order to save Ramadi. What a shame. I mean, what, a, what, what an illogical point. It is something that no one really can understand in Iraq today. And it shows the extent of the chaos. What, what are his options now? Can, uh, sorry, can I just, can I just change the narrative, the challenge, the narrative there for just one second, if this, uh, just for one second. The idea that the reason why the United States stopped, stopped supporting Maliki because he became too strong uh, is, uh, that's beyond my capability of comp comprehension. Maliki was extremely weak. He was trying to give the impression of being strong. Uh -huh. That was the whole image. He was trying to create this strong image, strongman image, but he was presiding over a, a deteriorating state, a complete house of cards, and a total paper tiger, right? But he was I mean, regarded as, too, as that, too strongly is, pro Shia. And the Americans he, didn't want was, that because they didn't want to get too much was, involved. They, but, they, never, they are always changing their mind. You know, they, 
about the United who to States support. Certainly has no problem with, with the, the United States certainly has no problem with a politician being too pro Shia or too pro Sunni. That's well, not the I problem. I think they do. The problem, they do. the problem that they had eventually. The problem that they had eventually is that is that he wasn't able to control the situation and that the and that the country was just falling apart on, under his watch. Right. If Mosul had not taken place. If Mosul had not fallen to ISIS, Maliki would probably still be prime minister today. And I don't think there's any question that you can, any way that you can question that. Not sure. Maliki was welcomed into the, Michael, Mal, Maliki was welcomed into the Oval Office by President Obama, not by President Bush, at a time where people in Iraq were, were, were going crazy over his actions and his statements, his unbelievable behavior, his corruption, and so on and so forth. He was welcomed into the Oval Office and he was praised by Obama. But what I'm, what I'm criticizing well, is Malik. the influence of the Americans uh, uh, head of state into domestic Iraqi politics. Uh, let me read a tweet to you, Regis Le okay. uh, Three men responsible for the growing unrest in parts of Iraq. Nouri al-Maliki is one. You can guess the other two. I guess he's alluding to George W. Bush and Tony Blair, but that's yes, what that's I suspect. A, that's a, that's for sure. I mean, there, there's there's obviously. I mean, the the debasification of oh. uh, I mean, held by Paul Bremer at the beginning led to a complete. Uh, collapse of the Iraqi state mm. because the American had no idea. I mean, some of them had, but there were not very many at this time that uh, from top to bottom, the judges, the schoolmasters, everybody, you had to be part of the Ba'ath Party or the Ba'ath system at one point if you wanted to climb in the society. Now, having, you know, <laughs> debasified Iraq, they led to a complete collapse of the state. I think that's what, that's one reason why the, the U.S. hesitated in, in targeting Damascus because they don't want the same thing to happen in Syria because what you, the, the, you were mentioning uh, uh, what happened at, at the end of World War II. Well, at the end of World War II, they were very skilled in letting in Germany in, 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 uh, after the war some form of state. They didn't want to um, fight an insurgency for years and they were relatively skilled in putting back right away the, the German federal government and implementing the mm. constitution. Um, another reaction on Twitter from Khalid after Iraq's army fled Ramadi. A 3,000 strong Shia militia is sent to Anbar to fight IS, a recipe for disaster. Use the army, uh, not militias. You heard a minute ago Alan Caval and Nivat saying how this is such an admission of weakness on the part of the new prime minister. Uh, the fact that he's calling up these militias to come uh, do the fighting uh, in Ramadi. But is there another option at this particular point in time? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's true that the current prime minister tried to keep the militias at bay after Tikrit and wanted this Anbar operation to be led by the Iraqi army alone, along with other uh, Sunni forces. But we can see that it's not sufficient at this point and that, of course, now to whom, uh, to whom, to, from whom to get help from. Well, let me add something that the, the militia push towards Tikrit was decisive at the beginning. It was not the Iraqi army who led the, 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 the push towards Tikrit. And the, the element like the Golden Brigade of the Prime Minister was in Tikrit and, and was in Ramadi as well. And when they're left without the support of the Shia militia, they just don't hold the ground. That's the, that's the, that's the reality. <clears throat> so it's tweet. very tricky because they have to, 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 uh, to count on the Shia militia in order to, uh, to, to, to uh, be successful. Which is and what, what we've seen before, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's an, uh, again, the uh, Iraqi, the uh, sorry, US Air Force is um, uh, striking this area with the Shia uh, militias coming in, uh, whereas in Tikrit they refused <coughs> to do so with, with the, the Shia on the ground. So this is also uh, a change. All right. Uh, in the fight to but take, it's worth, it's, it's worth just noting that that's, it's worth just noting the situation though is very different because in Tikrit, yeah, sorry, it's, it's just worth noting that the situation is very different between the two situations because in Tikrit that was a city that ISIS has already been holding for around about nine months. And so the United States didn't participate in the early stages of that, of that military campaign, uh, but, it, but ISIS was not pushing forward. It wasn't advancing. The idea was to try to make them retreat from an advance ahead they had made nine months earlier. Whereas now the concern is much greater. Now they're, they're making progress. There's a worry that if they consolidate their hold in Ramadi, that they might push much further into possibly even to the outskirts of Baghdad again. So that the, now the stakes are very different. You know, they, I don't know if I would describe them as being higher, but they're very, very different. All right, we mentioned in part one of our discussion how the, what the United States doesn't want to do 
is sent troops uh, in the fight to take back uh, Ramadi, by the way. Another precinct heard from this Monday, Iran. If Iraq made an official request to Iran in its capacity as a friendly and brotherly country to Iraq concerning the fight against these extremists, Iran would respond to this request. Uh, Zaid al-Ali, uh, that um, offer of help uh, from uh, one of the uh, senior advisors uh, to the uh, government in Tehran, Mr. Velayati, uh, is uh, that good news if you're an Iraqi? I mean, it's uh, of course no. It's not good news. You know, what the the only thing that would be good news to an Iraqi was would to be you know the the, the reestablishment of some form of a, of a state in, uh, in in Baghdad. You know, so but uh, you know, as your your previous speaker just alluded to right now, you know, we're facing a really desperate situation whereby ISIS is pushing into some of these areas, and something needs to be done to stop them. Uh, I don't think that anyone in uh, in Baghdad or other parts of the country will would accept that Iranian troops would be, uh, should be on the ground or there should be any significant Iranian presence. And I don't even think that uh, that's actually uh, happened at this stage just yet anywhere. And, you know, there's been advisors and perhaps uh, some assistance here and there, but no significant, uh, significant movement by Iranians on the ground. Um, and one of the problems, or one of the reasons why that's unlikely to happen now or even later, is that that would create divisions within the Shia community as well, because you know, many of your uh, viewers may know that uh, not all Iraqi Shias are, are, are too fond of the idea of Iran coming in on the ground and, and doing the work that they perceive themselves as, as, as doing themselves. But Iran, just like the United States, shares responsibility for the situation that we're in. And you know, to a certain extent, what would be very nice to hear at some stage from, from Iran, as from DC, from Washington, and also from Baghdad, is some form of mea culpa from all of these people for the situation that they put the 30 million Iraqi, uh, Iraqi citizens in. You know, this is a real tragedy, a human-created tragedy that no one wants to accept responsibility for, not in Tehran, Washington, or in Baghdad. All right. Uh, the, uh, uh, another aspect of this, and of course it's not just, by the way, the U.S. and the Iranians in this coalition that's uh, taking part in the airstrikes. There's countries like France that are uh, taking part. You know, a couple of days ago, uh, we had word that several hundred French nationals have been killed fighting in Syria and Iraq. There was uh, talk of getting that word out, that the allure of joining ISIS uh, would be stopped once people realize what it's really like there. But what we see uh, today, Anivat, is that uh, uh, ISIS is still on the advance. How do you think young p French people who might be tempted to join ISIS are going to react to all this? Well, I have met long ago in Chechnya which is a small republic in Russia, which was fighting against Russia at the time, 10 years ago. I've met French, young Frenchmen going there in order to fight, in order to participate to a war. Uh, the same kind of young men are now in Iraq, in Syria, and uh, I, I really doubt that we can stop them. We, they, they, they don't really know what they are going to find there. The only thing they know is that they want to fight. They want to exist through participating to a war. And they have plenty of opportunities, unfortunately. Alan Caval? Yeah, and I, it's a victory like this one is always good PR, of course, for this group. And it can attract <clears throat> people from, from Europe and elsewhere. But there are also other reasons why uh, these people are getting inside these, these jihadist groups. Not only what's happening there, but also what's happening here right. is, is part of the reasons. And, and even though there's been a high casualty toll, according to French authorities, like I said, several hundred French nationals killed. Yeah, but usually when you go to war, you expect <laughs> to be killed. <laughs> you don't That's think true. about and it. And there's yeah. also there's no way out. I mean, uh, you cannot uh, defeat defect uh, ISIS. I mean, it's very hard. Once they're over there, once they've been lured into uh, the caliphate and they've seen what uh, what's happening over there, well, it's a little too late to say mm -hmm. stop. Uh, I, you know, I better go come home. And that's another thing. You know, the, the, some of them have tried to co go back home. They're being monitored by uh, the, the intel of various uh, Western countries. Uh, but it's uh, it's tr it's very tricky. It's a very tricky situation because, as you said, uh, a victory like Ramadi could you know be you know make this appeal even uh, still very, uh, very present and still very active, you know. On that point, Zaid al-Ali, who holds the cards in making uh, jihadists' uh, movements uh, less appealing for, uh, uh, for, for young people who might be influenced to go out over there? Yeah, I'm not the, the best person to ask that question, but, uh, but the thing, you know, I, I'm confident that in every society, 
uh, you, you have a, a certain segment of every society that, that looks for outlets, uh, like, like the type of outlet that ISIS presents for itself. So today, I don't know if you, you were watching the news in Texas, but there are these in, in biker gangs that were fighting against each other in this incredibly violent way. You know, I'm not sure if we can really you know, create uh, analogies between them, uh, them and ISIS, but the, you know, there, there are segments of every society that are very, very violent and that look for ways in order to, to challenge their violence. Right? And ISIS presents a great opportunity for those people within the very broad and large Muslim community around the world, you know, the tiny proportion of Muslims who want to go and, and participate in acts of violence, they can do that you know, by traveling to Raqqa. And so you know, it, the, how do you stop them from, from doing so? I, I'm not sure if physically can be done. There, uh, certainly more efforts could be made. And try, how do you stop making it alluring? Uh, you know, I, I don't know if that can be done, because whatever you tell them, they probably won't believe. You know? So you would really have to, you know, put up the, you know, to tune up the propaganda a lot. But they would always, you know, th th those individuals who are willing to travel to Raqqa and to Mosul, in order to participate in, in acts of violence, will always look upon any type of message that you give them with a huge amount of skepticism. You know? so, but once again, I'm, not the, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very far from, 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 from the scenes and the, the, the communities that you're speaking, to, speaking about. So I'm not the best person to speak to about that. I would just add, uh, I agree with uh, what, uh, what's been said, but, but I would just add one thing is that I think that by uh, uh, our viewers must understand that uh, resolving or partly finding a solution in Iraq would make uh, ISIS retreat. It's not the, the, the war in Syria. The war in Syria was just a pretext. They, they gathered, took opportunity, and it's been well documented that they did as such before coming back to Iraq and, and getting large swath of, uh, of territory over there. But it's an Iraqi problem first. It's not the question of the Syrian civil war. So if Iraq, if we can find a solution, if the international community, the US or Iran or some form of power broker over there can find a solution there, I think we'll see ISIS retreat. All right, that'll be the final word for now. I want to thank you, Regis Le Sommier, and Nivat Alan Caval. I want to thank as well Zaid Al Ali for joining us from Cairo. Stay with us because our Media Watch segment is next. And let's say hello to uh, Emma James. Emma, the fall of Ramadi, what reactions have you been seeing? Well, this is being seen as one of ISIS's biggest triumphs in almost a year now in Iraq. And if we take a look at the Daily Beast, uh, their headline is ISIS counterpunch stuns US and Iraq. Uh, they say that US officials are living in a dream world if they think they've got the so-called Islamic State on the run. Uh, they say it's a counterpunch to the loss of Tikrit, which obviously happened a few weeks ago. Uh, the first big city that they'd won and then lost again. Uh, the US and Iraq had hailed that as uh, the the real start of the rollback of the militants. Um, but now the United States is saying that Ramadi is just a setback, not a real blow to them. Um, they said they expected episodic Battlefield successes. Battlefield setback. Yes. Uh -huh. The phrase these episodic successes. Um, uh, but what the Daily Beast is asking is when does that become a pattern of wins? Uh, when do you stop looking at it as a loss and when do you start looking at it as a win and vice versa? Um, now, if we take a look at the Washington Times, uh, they, along with many people, are focusing on the reactions of Senator John McCain no, no, to what's happened in Ramadi. He's a hawk. He's... Absolutely. And he is really being out and out a hawk about this. Um, he says... This is absolute proof that U.S. need to put boots on the ground in Iraq again. Um, now, in this, this article, is a minority view, by the way, in the United States. <laughs> Absolutely, but it's certainly getting a lot of attention, and it will get people talking about the issue more. Um, he says it's terribly significant, the fall of Ramadi. Uh, he told MSNBC, we're going to have to have more people on the ground. Uh, he's also placing a burden of responsibility on the Iraqi people themselves, saying that they have to change their attitudes and that military training has to be completely rethought uh, as a way to actually combating ISIS in Iraq. Um, some of his other comments have created quite a stir as well. Um, he's accused Martin Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, of not taking the capture of Ramadi seriously enough. He says his attitude has sent a message to the terrorist group that we don't care. Um, and he adds about Dempsey, he never fails to surprise me with his insensitivity. Now, the words of Dempsey have angered mm. veterans of the Iraq war and some of the families of those who obviously lost people 
not just this time around, but, but last time too. Um, and McCain is basically saying that the Pentagon is in total denial about the reality of what's happening in Iraq right now. When have we seen John McCain not asking for more troops on the ground? I mean, that's a question. No, I mean, McCain is doing his show. I mean, that's very expected. And, uh, uh, but, um, and to, you know, to, uh, to lecture the Iraqis saying you should behave this way, it makes me think of uh, Lenin's statement which said, uh, um, facts are stubborn, you know. So the, the Iraqi people are stubborn or what you wanted or you wish you would have with the Iraqi uh, people is not what you have on the ground. The reality is different. That's very American, very uh, ideological way of, the, of, of looking at things. All right, uh, well, we've been looking at Iraq. Another story you're looking at is the Cannes Film Festival. Yes, rather a gear change there, uh, but it is another controversy. Um, Kate Blanchett is receiving worldwide praise for her role in Carol, which is a lesbian love story, and it was screened yesterday at the Cannes Festi Film Festival, um, and many are tipping it to win the Palm d'Or. It, it is one of the hot favourites along with the lobster, um, but certainly more people seem to be coming out in favour of her. Uh, while we're on the subject of coming out, that's what's caused the controversy. She gave an interview to Variety, and in it, they wrote um, that she was she implied a bisexual past. Now, this is a, a mother of four. Um, she's married now. <coughs> and they asked her, uh, was this your first turn as a lesbian? And she rather cheekily smiled and said, oh, do you mean on screen or in real life? Um, and they said, well, you know, both. And she went on to say she'd had many relationships with women but wouldn't be drawn on any more detail than that. Now with this film being screened yesterday, she said, actually, I want to clear something up. Um, what was actually said was, um, did you have relationships with women? Yes, I did. Did you have lesbian relationships? No. Um, now, she's saying the remark's been lifted out with that rather important um, mm. addition cut off the end. Um, so what she said is, in 2015, the point is perhaps, should we care? Well, one person who does is the journalist who wrote that article in Variety. He has tweeted this. When I asked Kate Blanchett if she'd had lesbian relationships in real life, she said many times she was accurately quoted. So he's a little upset. Um, Kate Blanchett doesn't seem too worried about it, but did want to set the record straight. All right. A bit of a, a spin control there, it seems, on the part of uh, Kate Blanchett. Many thanks, Emma James. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for being with us here in the France Finquette debate. Mm.